I'm gonna wait a few minutes for everybody to chime in and refresh their browsers. Um, my lovely assistant will be set up in just a couple minutes. I'm still caffeinated. So I hope everybody is healthy and happy and enjoying their Mother's Day weekend. Um, here in Vegas, we're getting kind of a little excited because some of our businesses are getting ready to reopen, which is, in my opinion, amazing. Um, I just hope that everybody does uh, proper protocols and maintains their safety and safety for others. Uh, wash your damn hands, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, sorry about that, babe. Um, we're running a little bit late because I'm running late because I forgot I had a, an appointment for the dogs to get their shots this morning, so I was running around a little bit. <laughs> How are we looking, babe? Uh, we've got seven, so. Is Sister Nancy there yet? Yes, Nancy oh, is here. Oh, hello, Sister Nancy. So we're just gonna wait a few minutes for people to get in. Um, I like to have, you know, at least half the people who said they were going to be on, actually on. So, um, we're make a little he's making some noise with the ice machine. I decided to cook this way again um, because my mom says I should face the camera and I have the portable burner so I don't have to use the stove so this is that um, for those of you who are joining us for the first time thank you for chiming in this is a real kitchen this is my real house um, we have real dogs that may or may not bark uh, at any given time, but especially if somebody comes to the door or if my Boston Terrier thinks that somebody is walking down her street. So um, I hope you have all of your equipment out. Uh, we're a little chaotic right now, but it's gonna look a lot less chaotic once I get going. Um, so I'm gonna start in. Uh, here's my nine by 13 casserole. We're gonna start here. So. A strata is nothing more than a layered breakfast casserole, or any kind of casserole, really. Um, this particular one is like a savory bread pudding, which is hilarious, because I don't like bread pudding, but I really love this. So you want to start with stale bread, like I told you in the instructions. I actually had brioche left over that I shoved into the freezer from our first... Um, uh, quarantine kitchen from the croque madame incident and so I cut it up and I cubed it and I let it dry out on the counter and we're just going to put that in to the pan some's going to go on the floor the dogs will get a treat it'll be fine you just look see you don't have to be a professional to wear masks. Um, you just want to have a nice layer they don't have to be all um I stepped on one of my ass. Um, they don't have to be all touching each other. They just need to be in a general single layer into the bottom of the pan. Now, you can do this in glass. You could do it in metal. I'm happen happening to do this in stoneware. If you are using a piece of stoneware, I recommend that you take it out about 30 minutes to 45 minutes before you put it in the oven so that it has a chance to warm up a little bit. Frequently with stoneware, there will be thermal shock. You will shatter it, put in something cold into something hot or vice versa. And um, you could shatter your stone and then your strata is gonna be all over the inside of your oven, which is not cool. So, um, I need such a mess. Okay, so now we're gonna get working with our ham because we wanna get the ham going in the pan. I specified, and I hope I clarified this really well, Easter ham, you know, like ham that you slice for dinner, not the kind that comes out of the deli, okay? And I cut, I had a big piece of ham, I cut off about a pound worth, and we're just gonna kinda do it in 
a rough chop and we're gonna take off the big pieces of fat because ham is kind of fatty to begin with. And you wanna take out any um, cartilage or gristle that might be in there. And we're just gonna kind of roughly cut this up because we're gonna use a food chopper to chop it because we don't really want it in a dice. We want it kind of uh, almost like ground meat. If you are using sausage, now is the time to get it in the pan. For those of you that are working with electric stoves, I recommend that you put your pan on now, get your pan hot. Uh, you wanna do it over medium heat. And I'm just gonna take my little food chopper and kinda just coarsely chop it. See, it doesn't have to be in nice, even dices. We're gonna save that for the next one. If you wanna do this by hand, you can. Um, I've done it by hand before, but I'm just gonna use this food chopper today. You want them roughly the same size. It doesn't have to be uh, perfect. If you are working with bacon, you should be putting that in the pan now. Now with bacon, you can uh, cut it up before you put it in the pan so that it cooks you know, evenly that way. Or you can uh, cook it first and then crumble it after. Yeah, we just want this just kind of coarsely chopped. Doesn't have to be fancy. Any questions so far? Well, I think this is like really boring. Um, the other thing I wanted to let you guys know is that now with businesses um, getting ready to open up, you kind of don't need me to teach you anymore. But if you want me to, I will continue to do little quarantine kitchen episodes. Um, and give you some cooking, you know, at-home cooking lessons. Um, but that's up to you. I mean, let me know in the comments if you want me to keep doing this or not. I will tell you, I've had a lot of questions about the chicken salad. <laughs> and I have decided that this week, during midweek, I'm just going to come on, like maybe, I don't know, Wednesday or something, and I'm going to just do a little knife class, give you some tips about uh, working with your knife efficiently and you know how to do specific cuts with your knife. And I will make a chicken salad during the time. Okay? So we're gonna put our ham into the pan. Down a little high and turn it down a little bit because I wanted to get the pan hot. Um, and then I will post the recipe on my blog with your spooning. Um, if you are the first time joining us and you want to see some of the other videos that we've done, you can check out my YouTube channel, Good for Spooning. Um, you can follow along with me and see what I'm eating on Instagram, Good for Spooning. Look up Good for Spooning online. So I will be doing the chicken salad recipe midweek this week. Don't worry, I will tell you. Now I'm not, I repeat not, going to give you the recipe before I do it. Because it's really easy. And once you see me make it and I give you the measurements, you're going to go, Psh, I um, wonder. <laughs> Walter wants to know if you add butter to the pan. Um, you know what? Uh, it depends on how lean the protein is that you're working with. Thanks for asking. Sausage is really fatty. Bacon is really fatty. You don't need to add anything. Um, my ham, I took a piece of fat off of it and threw it in there. Um, if your ham is really lean and that's what you're working with, you might want to add a little bit. Man, I get a big old piece of gristle in here. Um, you might want to add a little bit of oil or butter at that point.
man. See this? We're going to pull all this out because that's no fun for anybody to chew on. You know, and that's kind of one of the reasons why I'm telling you to chop it up. Because sometimes ham has fascia in there and it's a little tough. And you don't want to be like me. So because my mom can't be with me for Mother's Day, uh, I have invited my friend Janet to come over. I've invited my friend Lynn to come over because their kids live elsewhere. Um, they are unmarried women. So they have nobody to treat them special. So John and I are going to be treating them special. Stir that. Yo, get Get out. I know better. That would be dog number three. Now I specified a pound, you could use a little more, a little less. I like a meaty dish, so I got pound in it. If you're using a meat substitute, like soy riso, or um, some other um, meat flavored thing, um, according to package directions. All right, so, you guys get out. I have dog number two and dog number three. Okay, just gonna take this and pitch it. And we're just, um, we just kind of want to brown this a little bit and get um, some of the moisture out because we're going to have plenty of moisture from our dairy and our eggs. That's a big piece of ham. Okay. And we're just going to let that keep cooking. Yogi. <laughs> we'll drop something on the floor and I have my own personal cleanup crew. All right, so remember I told you about the flavor ladder. Well, think of your strata as a ladder. Our first layer is our bread, and it could be whatever bread you chose. Our ham, our pork, our chicken sausage, you know, whatever meat substitute you're using, that's gonna be the second rung on our ladder, and now we're gonna work with our vegetables. So, they can, okay. I don't use my induction burner that often, so I'm always like, a little confused when I get to work with it. All right, so onions and peppers take longer to cook than our other vegetables that we're gonna be using, so we're gonna start there. And, you know, there's, there's a couple schools of thought on this. Some people say um, that you could throw the vegetables in raw, and you could. But I think when you saute them a little bit, you're going to add an extra level of flavor to whatever it is that you're cooking. And you're going to help break them down. Uh, in the case of onions, you're going to sweeten them up a little bit. In the case of mushrooms, they're going to get a little bit meatier. Um, the flesh becomes a little bit meatier. And so you're adding different textures and flavors to your lot. Okay. So remember with the onion how I told you, put your hand on the top, fingers curved away, thumb tucked in, hold your knife like this. I like a fine dice, so we're going to cut across as many times as you are comfortable. And then you're going to go top to bottom. And then you're going to go crosswise. And you'll notice my hand is kind of in a claw, and you'll notice my fingers are pulled back. That's because I don't want to cut my fingernails. I don't want to cut my fingers, but I still want to get a good grip on the onion. Onions are tricky. I gave myself one of my worst cuts ever, cutting an onion, because it slipped and I was doing a demo in front of 30 people and had to get eight stitches. 
yeah, that was a good one. <laughs> and if any of you are watching who were there, please feel free to chime in on how horrific it was. I was wow. mortified because I didn't even feel it. The knife was so sharp. And what about the guy who had to put the stitches in? Yeah, I call my husband. I'm like, hey, um, I cut myself. He goes, okay. I don't know. I cut myself 30 minutes ago and I haven't, I haven't stopped bleeding yet. And he goes, so what do you want me to do about it? I go, well, tell me where to go because I have to get this stitch. So I ended up coming home. He took me to his office in the middle of the night and did the uh, stitches there. Okay, so I put a little bit of butter into my pan. I've got my onions in there and I'm gonna turn my pan down because it was a little too hot. Now, if you're doing a vegetarian version of this, you can, if you're using broccoli, you might wanna put a pot of water on the stove and you can blanch that broccoli for just a minute or two uh, to kind of brighten it up and um, take some of the cooking time um, away from how long the broccoli is going to need to be in the straw. All right. I'm, my meat looks really nice. It looks... Um, it looks browned, it looks dry, which is what we want. We don't want it to be a greasy, oily mess. And I don't have a lot of fat in there to drain off, so I'm just gonna leave it where it is. Now I'm gonna move on to my bell pepper. <clears throat> There's a lot of different ways you could cut a bell pepper. I'm gonna show you the way I do it. Some people do it top to bottom and pull the center out. I cut the top off. I remove the stem and the insides and I just stick my fingers right in and twist and pull and it pulls out the majority of the seeds. Now, when you look inside a bell pepper, and I'll cut this one in half so you can really see what I'm talking about. There's ribs and the seeds will connect to the ribs. But if you cook these ribs, these white pithy ribs, they get really bitter. So you can either take a spoon or a paring knife and just cut them out gently. I actually like my melon baller and I just scrape so that the inside of my bell pepper looks like that. There's no pith. And this one, how beautiful is that? It's one of the most beautiful bell peppers I've ever seen. Um, by, by the way, I just want to take a minute and remind everybody that if you do get behind... Um, you can always pause your video and restart it as you catch up. You won't be watching live at that time, but you can go along at your own pace. Thank you for the reminder, babe. Your onions should be slightly brown, not blackened. You'll see, I started with a red onion. You see how they're starting to get a little bit brown. That's good. And you're going to push them off to the side into a cooler portion of your pan. And you're going to add your bell pepper. Now, I'm going to do this one by hand rather than with the chopper. I like to cut it into strips and then go crosswise. And I, and I like to keep everything about the same size, um, you know, for consistency, for the texture in your mouth. Um, so our, our bell peppers and our onions are both going to be about the same size. And we're probably only going to use about half of this bell pepper. Um, if your bell pepper is really small or really large, you can adjust, you know, in either direction. Um, I'm trying to think of what... Um, we're going to get to mushrooms in a minute, so if you're working with mushrooms today, just hold your horses. We're gonna, definitely going to pull those in. And what should people be doing with their protein at this point, Leanne? Just letting it sit, because we're going to layer it in. You should have, it should be either cooked or almost cooked at this point. If you're working with the sausage, you're going to drain that fat off. If you're working with bacon, you're going to drain that fat off and keep it for another use. And then when the bacon is cool enough, you're going to be crumbling it up. 
your sausage should be crumbled up like taco meat or um, you know like my like my ham looks and you should be draining the fat off like I said mine didn't have a lot of fat in it so um, I didn't have to drain anything if you're using chicken sausage that's probably really lean you probably don't need to uh, drain anything out of that and I'm pretty sure if you're using a meat substitute, you probably aren't going to have to drain anything either. Now you notice I cut my bell pepper into strips, and then I turn the strips sideways, and we're going to cut them across so we get a nice dice. And again, my hand is shaped like a claw. The claw. The claw. Because if you're doing this, you can cut your fingers. See, if you hold your, your produce like that, that's, you know, you gotta do it like this. And that way you keep your fingers safe, you keep your manicure safe, and nobody gets your blood in your food. <laughs> Which is, you know, nobody wants that. So I've had a really good time doing these, um, cooking demos with you. And you know, for those of you who haven't been following along from the beginning, my sister Nancy got the idea from watching from Porte Tapas do a demo and she said, Leanne, you should do this because you you teach me how to cook over the phone. Okay, so chances are if you're using one of these proteins, pork, sausage, bacon or ham, there's an awful lot of salt in there. Remember how I tell you, salt, 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 salt. Well, your vegetables don't have any salt in them. So we're gonna add just a little bit, about this many, this big a pinch, because we wanna pull some of the moisture out and we want every level, every step on our ladder to have flavor in it, okay? So, this is what my peppers and my onions look like now. And we're just gonna push them off to the side and let our pan stay warm. I have my pan on like medium, medium low. Okay, pop this over here. And now let's talk about mushrooms. I have got two different kinds of mushrooms that we're gonna be working with today. One are oyster mushrooms. And oyster mushrooms grow in a cluster like this. I don't know if you can see that. They're really pretty. And they actually taste and smell um, kind of oceany. You know, they kind of smell like a little, oyster. A little bit. umami. And yeah, and so mushrooms, in case you don't know, have an awful lot of that fifth, um, that fifth taste. You know, they say we have four taste buds, we actually have five. And the fifth one is umami. And so mushrooms, as a rule, are loaded with it. Now, when you're working with these cluster mushrooms, just cut that bottom part off and set it aside because you don't want to be washing mushrooms, okay? They grow in uh, a soil, and you want to just brush it off. If you wash a mushroom, it's a sponge. It's going to soak up all that water. And then it's, you know, you're just gonna be miserable, okay? Oh, I wanna put a little more butter in my pan. So um, in case you're looking at my shirt and wishing you had one just like it, this is my St. Anthony, the opinionated shirt. It's from a company called Cleaver and Blade. And they have uh, lots of really fun tongue in cheek stuff. And this design's actually available on like a prayer candle. <laughs> Very funny for me, I think it's hilarious. Okay, so we've got our oyster mushrooms in, and now we're gonna work on our regular button mushrooms. So here's a little tip about shopping for mushrooms. You wanna look for mushrooms, get a look at that there and see. It should be tight. You see there's no space between the stem and the cap? Look at that one. This one's fresher. This one is okay to eat, but it's just not as fresh. Okay, so if you have a choice to pick your mushrooms out of a bin, 
look for ones that are nice and tight like this. Now that goes for these crimini mushrooms. It also goes for white button mushrooms. Now I've already cleaned these and the way you clean a mushroom is you go like this and just brush off whatever residual dirt is on. Now, remember I used the, a couple weeks ago, I used the egg slicer to slice strawberries. It works great for mushrooms too. And I like it because I'm a little inner retentive, so I like everything to be the same thickness. It means they cook at the same speed. Um, each bite's gonna be about the same size. So it just, um, you can just lay them on the side like I'm doing, or you can lay them stem side up, it doesn't matter. And just use your egg slicer to slice them up. Okay, I'm gonna do a couple more just because I really like mushrooms. And they're good for you. And they cook down. And they cook down a lot because mushrooms have a lot of moisture in them. So your onions and your peppers should be off to the side of the pan. Your oyster, I'm sorry, onions and peppers should be off to the side. Your oyster mushrooms should, should be starting to soften up. And I'm going to add a little bit more butter just because I can. Wait for that to melt, and then we're going to pour in our crimini mushrooms. So this is what my pan looks like right now. See, I've got my onions and peppers off to the side, my mushrooms are right here, my oysters are off to the side, and my crimini are in the middle at the hottest part of the pan. See, what we're trying to do is not give you a gazillion dishes to clean up. So for those of you that are actually working with the kids today, great! This is a really easy recipe to get kids involved with because they can use the egg slicer to slice the mushrooms. They can, you know, put the bread into the pan. They're going to be able to use the hand blender or a whisk to help with the eggs. So it's, you know, it's a great recipe to get kids involved with. So I'm going to turn my flame up just a little bit. And again, three fingers on your thumb of salt onto the mushrooms to help draw that moisture out. It's gonna help them brown, first of all. It's also going to toughen them up a little bit so they have a little bit more of a meaty texture. So let's talk while we're cooking our mushrooms down. Let's talk a little bit about what's gonna to happen tomorrow. So, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we're gonna have our casserole in the refrigerator overnight. Now. This is also a great recipe to make in the morning and have breakfast for dinner. So if you're one of those people who likes to have breakfast for dinner, you can actually make this in the morning before you start your day. Throw it in the refrigerator during the day. When you get home, throw it in the oven and heat it up and then dinner's ready in 45 minutes, okay? So it's, it's a really great recipe and it has infinite, sorry, there's a fly. Um, and it's infinite possibilities for whatever's left over in your refrigerator. You know, if you have leftover smoked kielbasa or kielbasa, as some people call it. Um, I grew up saying kielbasa, so that's what I said. Um, if you have leftover kielbasa, dice it up, brown it in the pan to extract some of the extra fat, and use that as a basis. You know, you can mix and match your cheeses. We're going to do a little bit of cheddar and a little bit of Bonnery Jack today because. I have some of both, and I want to use them up. I don't want them to go bad. Um, you can, there's an infinite way to rip on this. And this is also a great potluck recipe. I have um, made this for potlucks with my bowling team. How long can it sit in the fridge? Um, you know, I'm gonna say maximum 12 hours. You know, I wouldn't let it sit any longer than that for two reasons. One, we're working with raw egg and dairy. And two, if you let it sit any longer than that, your bread's going to start to break down because it, it, it'll absorb moisture to a certain point, and then it will just start to fall apart. And we actually want our bread to still have some structure, which is why we dried it out to begin with. Okay, your mushrooms should be softening up, and at this point, you could start to mix them together with your onions and your peppers. So this is what my vegetable mixture looks like. Okay, can you, guys, can you see it? 
Is that good on the screen? Yeah. Okay. And I'm just going to let it cook down some more because I want the mushrooms. I don't want them to be too moist and add too much moisture to our recipe. So uh, back to how long it could stay in the fridge. You know, eight hours I think is optimum. We're starting this now. This is going to go, this is going to be in my fridge longer than 12 hours because, you know, I'm doing it at 1 o'clock in the afternoon here and it's going to get baked tomorrow morning. Um, overnight is best, 8, 10 hours, 12 hours. Um, but I, I wouldn't make it like two days in advance. You know, you could like make it this afternoon and make it for breakfast tomorrow and it'll be fine. All right, so we're going to start getting ready to do work with our eggs now. But now you can always cook it. Yeah, you can cook it and then reheat it if that's what you want to do. So I started saying this is what we're going to talk about for tomorrow. So you're going to take, you're going to leave your aluminum foil on it. You're going to put it in the oven at 350 for about 30 minutes. And then you're going to check it. And your cheese should start to be melting. You're going to take that foil off. And you're going to leave it in there for another 10 to 15 minutes. And when you can stick a knife, you can use a... Um, a paring knife, I don't know, oh, here's mine. You could use a paring knife and stick it into the center. If that knife comes out clean, you're good to go. Cake tester, paring knife, toothpick, you know, anything along those lines. You know, test it like you would a cake. If it comes out like really wet, stick it back in. Because you want it to be tender and moist, but you don't want it to be sloppy and gloppy. It's not supposed to be like, it's gonna be, a, it'll, it it'll look like four. raw egg if it's not cooked all the way through. Now, remind them if they are using the stoneware. Okay, so if you are using glass or metal, you can just take it right from the fridge, put it right into the preheated oven at 350. If you are using stoneware like I am, you're going to take it out and leave it on top of the stove to kind of bring it to room temperature a little bit while your oven preheats and then put it in the oven. Okay, so it should be out for at least a half an hour to kind of bring it up to room temp before you stick that cold stone into a hot oven. All right, so we're gonna talk about our eggs. I have mentioned this before, I'm going to say it again. I like to crack my eggs into a bowl for two reasons. One, I wanna make sure I'm not getting any shell in there because it's a little bit easier to pull a piece of shell out of here than it would be to pull it out of a group of eight, you know? Um, I've got two, I've got two. So it gives you an opportunity to look at the egg and make sure that it's an okay egg. You know, you don't want, if it, you know, if you, so every now and then, especially if you're lucky enough to get fresh farm eggs, you'll get an egg that's not great. So this gives you an opportunity to check your egg over, make sure that there's no shell in there before you dump it into the big uh, batch. And I use large eggs. Um, you can use extra large, just know that it's gonna change your cooking time because you're gonna have a little bit more moisture in there. Um, you can use an egg substitute for this if you are trying to watch your cholesterol or if you're vegan. Um, yeah, egg whites. You can use egg, well, you could use egg whites, but there's a big fat but, just like mine, when it comes to the egg whites. They have a tendency to be a lot drier. They're not as moist as working with something that has a yolk. So you have to, you know, compensate for that. All right, so now we're going to get our dairy. You can actually do this dairy-free uh, if you have a lactose issue um, or if you're just trying to use up soy milk or almond milk or oat milk that's in your refrigerator. You could do that. We're going to do half of our fluid in whole milk. Yes, you can use 2%. Yes, you can use skim. The texture will be slightly different. And then we're going to do half and half. You know, Nancy had asked me, hey, can I use heavy cream? Yes. What you want to do is since half and half is literally half heavy cream and half milk, you want to use a cup and a half of milk 
and a half a cup of heavy cream. Boom. <clears throat> so you're still getting two cups of dairy in your... Or moisture. Now, what, what would people use if they are lactose intolerant? Yeah, they can use any milk substitute, like I said. <clears throat> and you're going to use two cups. And you might want to put in um, a tablespoon of flour to kind of give it a little bit of a binder to thicken it up. Or if you've got arrowroot powder, you might want to put a teaspoon and a half of that in or cornstarch, just some kind of thickener to give it a little bit more body because our half and half is thicker than the milk or our heavy cream is thicker than the milk. And I know that the soy milk, the almond milk, the oat milk, they, they have a tendency to sometimes be a little thin. So you just want to put a little bit of thickener in there to, you know, give it a little bit more body. Okay. So we are going to add in half a teaspoon plus or minus, of uh, Coleman's dry mustard. You could use any brand you like, but I have Coleman's here. And we're going to add, I'm using white pepper today because I like the floral notes that come from white pepper, but you can use any pepper you like, black, multicolored, white, whatever. We're just gonna put about a quarter to a half a teaspoon of pepper, so that's a, like a good 10 or 12 brines. You, because there's no salt in this at all, guess what we're gonna put in here? Salt. So I'm using, again, the same three fingers. That's roughly between a half and a quarter. I'm gonna do twice. Now let's talk about our hand blender. If you are using a hand blender, I'm gonna give you a major tip do not start it here and then try to lower it in because you will end up wearing whatever it is that you're trying to mix up. There are a couple <coughs> of people watching that I know have done this. So you want to put it in and then start it, okay? And you can pulse it to get it started. If you're using a whisk, whisk away. What you're looking for is a nice homogeneous mixture. Your, um, your mustard powder and your spices should be thoroughly mixed in. You shouldn't have any lumps except maybe flax of pepper. And it's gonna look like a really pretty, like pale vanilla pudding kind of color. If you get a few bubbles, that's fine. If you're using a whisk, you're probably still working with it, and that's cool. Take your time, do it the right way. I'm gonna unplug this and put it away. Again, for those who are just joining, you can always pause the video and catch up on your own. Okay, and now we're gonna talk about cheese. I love cheese. It is like my favorite dairy product, okay? Um, it should have its own food group as far as I'm concerned and um, I don't see a problem with mixing cheeses I think that mixed cheeses are a beautiful thing so we're going to use some sharp cheddar and a coarse grater um, you could use a fine grater but I think that the texture of the coarse grating when it melts is a better choice for this particular type of dish and um, this is kind of a firmer cheese, so you wanna let it come up to room temperature just a little bit. It'll grate easier. So there's the first part of our cheese. Isn't that beautiful? And now we're gonna move on to cheese number two. Now if you have more than two cheeses and you wanna go for it, knock yourself out. So I'm gonna tell you, you will never see me buy pre-grated cheese. And there are a number of reasons for that. The first one is I'm too cheap, okay? When you look, and next time you go in the grocery store, I really want you to look at the dairy case where the cheeses and those pre-shredded cheeses are kept. And you're gonna see on, you know, when I was a kid, we had to actually do math to figure this shit out. But now they put the information right on the price tag for you. 
It's going to tell you how much the package costs. And then next to it, it's going to tell you how much it costs per ounce or per pound, depending on the packaging. Okay? I want you to look at what a four, six, or eight ounce package of pre-grated cheese costs. And then I want you to go find the same size piece of whole cheese and tell me how much cheaper it is. It's three times more sometimes to buy the pre-grated cheese. That reason number one, I'm cheap, okay? Reason number two, it is coated in something called cellulose fiber in many cases, which is nothing more than finely, finely, finely shredded paper so that it doesn't stick together or paper doesn't melt. Reason number three is that this melts better and it tastes better because there's no additives in it. You look at these ingredients and it says cheese. <coughs> it doesn't say disodium phosphate, cellulose powder, BHA, blah, blah. It says cheese, okay? I, the main reason I buy it in the brick is because I'm cheap, but those are the other really good reasons to not buy cheese um, that's pre-grated. So we are, look at this, I love Monterey Jack. Now, the reason I'm picking the two cheeses is they melt a little bit differently. Um, cheddar has a little bit more oil in it, and Monterey Jack's a little drier, so when we mix them together, it makes the perfect melt. And I'm just gonna take this big piece that fell off. Okay, so I've got about eight ounces of cheese here, plus or minus. I don't think you can have too much cheese personally. And when I get in here and start assembling this, if I think it needs more, I'll grate some more. All right, so now we're gonna assemble. Just like the Avengers. Okay, you I'm gonna take that piece of fat out that I put in to keep it You nice. wanna stop and solicit questions at this point before yeah. we go further? I'm, I'm getting ready to assemble. So, I'm gonna straighten up my work area a little bit because I can't stand it. Are there any questions about what I've done so far? Do you have questions about ingredients that you're using that I'm not demoing today? Um, do you have questions about the cheese that you're choosing to use? Come on, hit me. Nothing so far, which is great. I'm gonna take a little drink of my iced tea because I know that I'm on a 10 second delay. Nothing coming through. Okay, great. How many people are watching? Uh, you've got 18. Okay. 20. You've been bouncing. All right. So, the first level in our ladder is our bread, right? And your bread should be in the bottom. Now we're going to add in level number two. And we're just going to evenly distribute our meat across the top of the bread. Now you can build this in any order you like. I'm telling you how I build it, okay? If you put your, your cheese in first or your vegetables in first or whatever, that's fine. I like to do my meat first, okay? And you kind of want to distribute it evenly, okay? Now we're gonna move on to our vegetables. And again, this is after it all cooked down. See how much, there? there's really not that much there. So we're just gonna sprinkle it gently across. So you must be going slow enough for her today. Or Walter's cooking. Or Walter's cooking. <laughs> Which is what I think the case is, actually. All right. So now we've got that in. I'm just going to kind of make sure that it's pretty even. All right. Now we're going to put in half of our cheese on top of our veg. Now, if you are using, if you elected to add hot sauce to 
your recipe, I told you it was an option. You can add uh, a couple of the dashes to your egg mixture, which is what I'm gonna do before I mix it in. I prefer Texas Pete hot sauce for a number of reasons. This one happens to be the sauteed garlic version. Um, 10 years ago today, I was actually working with the Texas Pete team at um, Vegas Uncorked here, Bon Appetit's Vegas Uncorked. And um, I didn't know anything about Texas Pete at that time, but one of the things that I found out is First of all, I love them because they're a family-owned company. They are not publicly traded. Garner Foods. Garner Foods, right? And number two, they're not super vinegary like some other brands that begin with a T. Um, their flavor profile is nice. It's clean. They have a, uh, a cha sauce, which is Asian-based, and then they're classic. But the garlic is my absolute favorite. Um, Sorry guys, I need a whisk. All right, I thought I had all my tools out. Maybe. Okay, so we're just gonna add a couple of dashes. I just let it drip in gently. You don't want it so spicy that you can't eat your food, but what this does is it kind of pulls everything together, like a good bread. And then you're gonna pour this right onto Whole so it just adds another layer it to adds your another layer on flavor, flavor layer. ladder. That's right. And you'll see my pepper because it was freshly ground is kind of sticking inside the the bowl. We're gonna make sure we get it out. So you'll see sometimes the I'm gonna tilt it in a minute. Um, I don't want to tilt it too much because it's super liquidy. But you want to make sure that your bread is in the egg mixture because sometimes they float I'm up. I'm going to zoom it? in on it, yeah. Okay. So you want to push down, make sure your eggs are touching the bread. All right? And now we're going to add the rest of our cheese because, damn, <laughs> I love cheese. So this is basically going to be kind of like a Denver omelet. Um, that's why I called it the Denver version. If you're using chorizo, um, you could be using, you know, like I said, saute your peppers, your onions together. Um, if you're doing the sausage version, I've actually done this where I completely left the vegetables out and just did sausage egg and cheese, and I was thrilled with it. It was perfectly fine. Um, you could do this any way you want. So. If you are doing the vegetarian version, you just skip layering the meat, but layer in your cooked vegetables, then your blanched broccoli or whatever, put your egg on top, top it with the cheese, and then we are gonna put this right, we're gonna cover it with foil, and we're gonna put it in the refrigerator overnight. So what's gonna happen in the fridge is that all of your flavors are gonna get a chance to melt. So they'll blend together. And then, the bread, the stale bread, is gonna soak up the eggs, and it's gonna get like this really great texture. Um, it, it's like almost like a souffle. And if you're wondering about my little foil thing, it's from King Arthur Flour. can order it online. And you just want to get that nice and tight all the way around. Some pans will be a little bit easier than others. And then you're just going to pack this in the fridge. So your instructions for tomorrow are take a casserole out, put it on top of the stove, preheat your oven to 350 degrees, put your casserole in for 30 minutes, then remove your foil and check it. Your cheese should be starting to melt at that point. Leave the um, foil off and cook it for another 10 to 15 minutes. You wanna check it at 10 minutes, check it for doneness the way you would a cake with a cake tester, a paring knife, 
the tines of a long fork, toothpick, what have you. Get in there, test it. If it comes out wet, I mean wet, put your foil back on, stick it in for another 10 or 15 minutes and double check it. So the very last step should be taking your foil off and allowing the cheese to get just a little bit brown on top. You don't want it brown like toast. You just want a little bit of brown here and there and it should, your cheese should be bubbling and super melty and then you're good to go. You're gonna take it out of the oven and you're gonna let it set for about 10 or 15 minutes just so everything has a chance to set up. And when you go to serve it, you could serve it one of a couple ways. You could cut it like you would a lasagna and serve it in squares, or you could set it up buffet style, which is what we're gonna do tomorrow, and serve it like spoon bread. Just put a spoon and let everybody just scoop up however much they want. It's super easy. Like I said, you can also do this breakfast for dinner. Um, you could do it with leftover chicken and spinach. You could do it with all of the options that I gave you in the original um, shopping list. So just play around with it. It is a super, super simple thing. Really, really easy. Any other questions, babe? Super simple today. So I'm gonna ask you, do you want me to continue doing these once your restaurant's open? Because I'm doing this for my sister Nancy and for you. Uh, I enjoy it, don't get me wrong, I enjoy it. But if you don't wanna watch, I'm not gonna bother. <laughs> because it's just, you know, then I'm just stroking my own ego and I don't need to do that. I don't have anything to prove. So let me know either in the comments or um, when you post the pictures of your finished dishes tomorrow, uh, let me know that, yeah, I want you to continue cooking or nah, this was fun while it lasted, but you know, you could get back to your regular life now. So um, anything that, I'm gonna hang out for just a couple minutes. I'm also gonna talk to you about garnishes while I'm waiting for everybody to catch up. You can finely chop parsley, and I have some right here. Um, you could finely chop parsley and sprinkle it on after it sets for 15 minutes. Thinly slice some green onion. Um, if you want to go super spicy, you can finely chop some serrano or Fresno chilies and put those on top. Those look really pretty. Um, you could do cilantro if you're doing the um, Mexican version with the chorizo. Um, you can do finely chopped sage leaves if you're doing the breakfast sausage. That might look really pretty. Um, so just find something green to sprinkle across the top. Once it sets, and then you can serve and you're good to go. So uh, that's all I've got for you today. I'm gonna clean up my kitchen and put this in the fridge. Uh, my husband is gonna be making cinnamon rolls to go with this for tomorrow because I love them and I never make them because they're a pain in the ass. Um, I only make them when I have insomnia and I wake up in the middle of the night and then I have to be quiet and make cinnamon rolls because they take a long time. So- um, And I've got a, a special uh, twist on the the yeah, frosting. He's so. playing with the frosting, so it's, <laughs> it should be fun. So, happy Mother's Day to all of you moms, you stepmoms, adoptive moms, uh, dads that are doing mom and dad duty, and all of my same sex pals who are raising beautiful children together. Happy Mother's Day to you, too. So, it's really Happy Parents Day. You know, just because you push out a kid, that's not what makes you a mom. What makes you a mom is being there for the tough stuff. So happy Parents Day, and love you all. Thanks for watching. Share the video. If you've got questions, post them in the comments. And I hope everybody has a great day tomorrow. Bye.